as time is running, I'm going to start to introduce my co-panelist. The first one who will speak, Olivier Marbeuf, is an author, performer, curator, and film producer. producer. He is the founder of the Space Chiasma Center in Lille-Lille, in, in Paris, I mean in the suburbs of Paris, a suburb north, northeast of Paris, which he directed from 2014 to 2018. At Chiasma, he developed a program focusing on minorities, representation, and post-colonial situations through screenings, debates, performance, and collaborative projects. His texts operate at the intersection between poetic fiction and speculative theory. He is interested in place as a form of presence and the body as a landscape. Drawing on the imagination and literature of the Caribbean as much as the mythology of the suburbs, Marbeuf explores ways of making visible the history that has, that is imprinted on minority bodies and the narratives of itinerant communities. Olivier, tu peux y aller. Thanks, Kader. Uh, thank you all. It's a really long day, so we got the the last panel, and I'm super happy to be with my co-panelists too. Thanks to Anna and all the team here. Um, two things. Uh, from the first abstract I gave before the conference, I decided to try to recompose it, and I like to decompose and recompose it in as an echo of things that we talked since two days, because when you come last, you got all the echoes of all the conversation, and so I really believe in that kind of uh, polyphonic conversation and infinite conversations. So I will try to recombine that. Uh, and a, a, really, a really nice surprise is the first time of my life I did a PowerPoint. Because I saw academics doing that. I said, oh, it's quite cool. And says, I'm going to do myself for the first time. I'm a storyteller. Normally, I'm just imprint stories in your brain directly, but I will use also a PowerPoint, a such a kind of PowerPoint, but my first one. So it's cool. I think there is nice, cool things to say. Um, the point of departure of this talk is coming, in fact, um, from uh, another invitation I received, but that I've been really, um, that now is an echo of what's happening here, from a, a curator who, reading my text, invite me to talk, to take part to a supposedly very serious reflection about monoculture and pluriculture. Arguing that at the end, identity politics of people of color, of indigenous and so on, were perhaps problematic as a defense of a kind of monoculture when it was necessary even urgent to build a new community based on pluriculture to fight against fascists in Europe. So it's nice because really what happened when, when you are a person of color is that really often people got an agenda for you, you know? A lot of people tell me, you should do that. And I, I always ask it to people, is it happened to you that people tell, have an agenda for you? So that person have an agenda for me reading my text and invite me to talk about uh, the identity politics as a kind of monoculture would give a kind of matter to, to fascism. And so it, I already talked yesterday about the urgent desire of community coming from the white left agenda, which is for me a way, conscient or not, to refuse the possibility of any kind of autonomy in the community's making coming from the managers. Uh, community building is often a threat uh, as a danger by the right as by the left in France under the name of communitarism. But I will keep today the tension coming from the left in between a supposedly monocultural desire by making a detour through the plantation as a primitive site of global capitalism. I say a detour, uh, and as Kader said yesterday, because there, no, there is no possible return from the colonial violence. So I choose here the Creole storytellers traditions to make a so-called detour which means to come back in the past in a movement of spiral in the sense of the reinvention of a potential future thanks to a particular attention to colonial episodes and infrastructures. As the Maroons, and we'll, I will talk about Maroons later, the runaway slaves, 
grabs fragments of history of landscape and sensation and violence in their own body. And I will talk also about the body as um, uh, a site and also a tool for archiving a certain kind of archive that doesn't exist outside of the body as documents. So about the racism, as we talk, um, as we talk in the, the, the day before, there is that first leave, we try to say that uh, our racism was not only a problem, a psychological problematic for white people. But by saying that, we let open the idea that it could be a psychological problematic for people of color. I think there is two different levels that we have to try to examine at the, at the same time. The first dynamic is the dynamic of the capitalism, uh, the, the racism as a dynamic of capitalism and colonialism. That means the systemic dynamic, as we talked the day before. But we also have to consider another thing which is quite harder to, to work with or to be with, it will be to consider the racism as something experienced by people. That means that, of course, it's a systemic and structural uh, problematic, but it's also an experience. And I think we forget to talk about it since today. So there is the, that debate in between essentialism and anti-essentialism of racial and identity, and I do think the central point is to understand that race is not, is in one end a system, a, cons a system a construction, but in the other end the result of particular experiences that create particular form of life, relation with death, form of feelings and telling. And I think it's necessary to consider that second aspect of racism in the process of building a new community, a community to come, a new commons. This is not only a psychological dimension, but an historical echo that some particular body make irritable and visible. Because in the context I want to talk about, um, a large part of the archive and a dark part of the law are inscribed on and in the body itself. So I will argue that the metastructure of racism as a part of capitalism is not immediately and often not easily visible. And so the day before we talk about the visible infrastructure of racism uh, in the colonialism uh, uh, system and in the capitalist system too. But I do think a large part of the racism in the capitalism is in one end really uh, the base is really the structure of it, but is an invisible structure. And so we need a particular attention and particular tools and I think particular body to be understand to, to understand and make visible that uh, what I call that dark part of the object. So to examine the condition of construction of racism as a dynamic of capitalism, we create requires to work on different layers, which are all very concrete, but don't stand at certain level of visibility. And I will try to talk also today, uh, this afternoon, about visibility just after the panel we have just before about the recognition. Of course, I think there is a kind of paradox in the struggle for people of color, which is the desire of visibility, which in certain way, uh, uh, as it's happened with the face recognition uh, software, some people, black people claim that um, they got a problem with the fact that the algorithm is not able to recognize them. And that kind of recognition is a really word uh, where I say to come back to the visible, because I, I will put as an argument that um, people, Afro descendant and descendant of slaves, are always in a process of reapparition. It's not an apparition, it's a reapparition from the world of objects. So that reapparition is a political dynamic that we have to examine and we have to try to, to understand what could be that reapparition out of a desire of the visibility as it organized by the white system. So I think, for instance, the, the software for face recognition uh, is not able to recognize really well black people and it's a good thing. 
we can let that level of visibility of people that want in that kind of visibility. And we will see in the context of the plantation, I will describe really right now, that there is different level of visibility, different desire of visibility, different level of invisibility, different desire of invisibility. That's mean that visibility and invisibility can be considered uh, in one hand as consequences of violence, but also as political statement from people of color. Um, yeah, so I just decided to take the, the, the plantation in the context of the Caribbean Highlands. I think it's necessary to be quite precise, because as we talked just before, there is really different uh, context of the um, of the slavery. And taking the plantation is not taking the slavery as a, a global idea and makes sometimes the confusion in between forced labor and slavery, which is a confusion we don't have to make at all. Taking the plantation is taking something more than the slavery, is taking an ecosystem. And it helps us to understand in the, the global uh, uh, capitalism system the issue of uh, the racial ecology and a racial dimension of the ecology. So the plantation is useful for that, because you really understand what kind of system are struggling at that very primitive moment of the capitalism. And I do think, like other people, that plantation is also a kind of spectral capitalism. That means in a certain way that it come before, but also stay as a kind of idol of the capitalism. Because there is no more ideal capitalism than capitalism, uh, capitalism able to decide in one hand to make you work without paying you, but more than that, as you said just before, to decide of your life, of, of your death, of different kind of activity on your body. Your body has a kind of resource and a kind of distress of all the phantasmas of a human. So it's more than a false uh, work and, uh, is something is something more connects to the maximum potentiality that we can extract to somebody. So it's a kind of spectral capitalism in the sense of it's impossible to have so many possibilities with the body outside of that kind of very specific uh, display that uh, plantation is. So uh, yeah, this is my PowerPoint. Yeah, I know I, it's the first one, so please. Yeah, I think you will see there is a good reason to be small. I think, I think I'm going to try something. You know, because American uh, academics, they are always standing sometimes. So. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I saw Solomon uh, on the internet. It's quite, it's, no, it's quite cool. <laughs> so, and, yeah, it's working. So, okay. Soil. Clean the soil. Clean it. Kill everything. There is nobody now. A Terranilius. You can come now. Build a house. A safe place. A core. There, they will have only one family. Everybody will call you daddy. Everything will be on your shoulders. It's your burden. You are the center. You are the light. The sweet and fragile light in the obscurity, the plantation. In the middle of the plantation, there is a house, and there is masters, because they can be male, but we forget that they can be female, too. I'm sorry for the white feminist. <laughs> so there is masters with a hess, and there is the house slave. And the house slave is that really specific matter I just talked before that you can use for a lot of things. But people always think that in the first house is not already the plantation, it's really the settling, it's really the beginning, it's only the house. You know that 80% of the people that participate to the colonial um, colonization of the Caribbeans, they die when, on the first month because of the different virus on that region. So only 20% stay, so they create that kind of safe place, surviving place. And the first thing they have is the house slaves, and this is the first structures, and it's also something to create a kind of space of care. 
The idea of care is the idea of the use of the body until there is nobody. You know, a kind of product that you can use and is care about you. So in the house, the house slave don't have always function except being our slave and except being a kind of matter that you can use. And so there is a plantation. That means the plantation is bigger than a horse, but with the plantation appear two other characters on the storytelling. The Creole are slaves and the field slaves. Why there is a house slave and a Creole house slave? Because there is something you have to know about the, the term Creole. That term Creole in the first instance means born in the colony. So the white people in the colony are Creole and the black people born in the colony are Creole too. At that moment, we don't use Creole for another sense at that very moment. So the difference, in, and we will see in the economy of the plantation, the difference between the house slave and the Creole house slave is that the Creole house slave are born in the colony. So there is really a question, how you can have somebody born in a plantation in a context of radical separation, racial separation. So there is different system, I would say. There is, let's say, the British and also the Dutch system, which is quite the same. You build a house and you put slaves in and you ask them to reproduce themselves to produce new slaves. This is how we have more slaves and we have sometimes Creole slave. This is one of the reasons. Of course, the Creole slave, and we will see that they are a part also of the free men and women of color, the Creole slave can be also son and daughter of the master. Because in the house, we can also use the slave to rape them and to produce such a kind of slave that they will begin free slave. It's one way of becoming free in the plantation. But the French system is quite different than the English one and the Dutch one because the idea of the, uh, of the French government, which is quite a clever idea, even if it's less capitalist than the, the British and the Dutch, because they, they invent capitalism. So they decide to reproduce the slave and the French people says, no, there is another issue. If people are reproduced in the plantation, they will have in time a certain kind of knowledge of the plantation a certain kind of culture, they will know the place, call, they were born there, and after the, the, the children will know, and after that, after several generations, they will have a kind of knowledge of the plantation context. And in the French uh, government, the strategy says no, they always have to be as the first day of their life here, so they decide to have a, a permanent importation of new slaves from Africa until the end of the colony. So it's a really different system. And so the term Creole is really used often to, as an opposition to the slave coming from the Africa, which is called Bosal. So when nowadays we say Creole, it's always an opposition with the Bosal, and no opposition between carbon people and African people. So the term Bosal is not a sweet term, just to say African and close to the slavery. And Creole is the first step from the blackness to a certain kind of whiteness. It's the idea of a, a step towards a certain kind of respectability. And of course, there is a well-known field slaves. And some of them are walking, some of them are used also to make some different things, you know, to, to bring something from here to there and extra. So I had another level around, it's just to say, to describe the plantation is try to complexify the idea of, of the construction of the blackness and the relationship between blackness and whiteness in that context, showing that there is a lot of different layers that are, that I will have an echo of how the struggle and how also the dynamic of racism exists in the Caribbean and in uh, the, the Western country too. So what is the Maroons? Maroons is the, um, is the runaway slave. In fact, in the, can I point, you know, with a red light, I, I like that idea too, but I don't know how to do that. I think normally you can point and show things. Yes, like that. Ah, yes, cool. Yes, cool. I'm sorry, so for, uh, I'm trying to. Okay, so 
We are there. No, me. It's cool. Wow. It's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> so from that from that space, of course, there is the possibility of uh, of uh, Phil's slave to become maroon. That's that's mean a runaway slave. But this we call that space the space of the small marronage, petit marronage, that means that we often the slave, feel slaves that are living for one day, for one night, not only living definitively from the plantation, and they really go back and forth as a kind of training also of what is possible. Why? Because there is a global storytelling of the space of the plantation, which is, we'll see it will be the white space, and that white space is the pace of the wall. The master explained to the, to the slave that after the, the limits of the plantation, the only one thing they will find is death. So this is the, a world of obscurity. And so experiment that move from the field to really the, the, the hills, more often sometimes the jungle nearby, is really an experiment of the taste of another kind of death, cause the plantation itself is death. It's a kind of a social death. It's a wall of objects, they are not human. So moving from that part to that part, is try to experiment another potential human death. As the dead, as human in, they try to, test, to come back to the humanity through a certain kind of death. So it's, I think it's really important because the, the former panel finished with the, uh, an idea of what we can do. We can do a lot of things. Imagine people enslaved in those conditions radically. They had find enough hope to go through the death to come back to a certain kind of humanity and dignity. We've got much more means than them to do something. Much more. So around that, there is another category that really often is forgotten, is the free people of color. Everybody thinks that the, the slavery time is the white people and the black are slaves. No, not all the people are slaves. Part of them are free. And how they are free, there is different way. They can pay to be free, because we are in a capitalist system. So they can accumulate some means in some uh, context, and not all the contexts and not all con the, uh, the colonies, where they can uh, sell a part of what they are producing themselves. And we'll talk about ecology just after that, how they can produce things for themselves. They can sell in the market of the town, so they can pay. Or, and it's really often the free people of color as really often, and it's also an issue of visibility, they are really often what we call in a Caribbean context, the mulatres. Mulat means mixed races people. So there is also something in between the whiteness of the plantation, the blackness of the maroon world, and the mixed races color of that world people of color. So those people can have their own plantation and sometimes their own slaves, but they are black. And so we will see there is a kind of permanent negotiation, economical negotiation, movement of value, but also negotiation for visibility in between the different category of people. Because in certain way, being in the house, closer to the master, is also to have a certain distance with death. The space of death is there in the plantation and around, again, there is space of death. And over the space of death, there is a new kind of space of life for the free people of color, which include, of course, a lot of racism, but that space of life got also a lot of contingency with the plantation, we will see. Okay, and there is the last part that people forget, which we call the grand marronage. So as I says, the space of the petit marronage, the small marronage, is more a space of 
in certain way of training, of trying to leave the plantation for one, two, or three days. What happened to a slave when he's getting out of the plantation for one day, two days, three days? When he's coming back, there is a really, sell, uh, a really famous code called the Black Code, or the Code Noir for the French colony. And what is the Code Noir? It's not exactly a law, as if, even if it had been uh, organized by the government itself, the colonial government. It's more something like a user guide, you know? You bought a slave, don't, don't, don't destroy your slave. You know, it's, like, it's, it's just to explain you what to do with your slave. So you bought a slave and you have to, to know how to, in certain way, use in the better way as possible your slave. So the Code Noir is a kind of really clear inscription of the law in the body of the slave. If he live one day, you will cut a piece of his ear, so other people around will know that he, he, he make a fault. If he live more, for more, more than one week, you will cut a part of his leg, etc. But you don't have to kill your slave, but it can happen. So the court, the court noir never said don't kill your, cell, your slave. He says your slave is a matter that you have to use. So if you kill it, you kill your own uh, means of doing things, your own tools. So it's a way to, to take care about the, uh, your goods. And so I will just saw in the plantation the, uh, the different level of visibility. So of course, the, uh, no, it's not that, it's that. Of course, in the in the center, there is this, the white space, and this, this is the space of light and hypervisibility. The maroon space is a gray zone. There is again the town, which is a white zone, and there is a darker zone in for the grand marronage. The grand marronage means when the slaves are leaving, not to coming back. And they are living so far that sometimes they can stay there, here. So the, the, the story of the Maroons culture, and I'm not indigenous Maroons, and I will explain really quickly what I mean. Those Maroons live far from the plantation, and, and there is different context, and in different, really in that case, on the geography itself. There is some islands that are so small that it's not possibility to, to do a grand marronage, but there is some context where you can do a grand marronage for a specific reason. For instance, in the, in Guyana, in Suriname, and all the, 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 the zone of Amazonia, for a really long time, uh, at the beginning of the Brazil, people forget that during 25 years, the, a Dutch administration where uh, was the, the administration was Dutch in the in the Brazil. We call it the Dutch Brazil. And they do they did something really logical as a let's say a capitalist power. They says there is some problems. I will show you the economy. Yeah, the economy is there. If you Look at the economy of the plantation. We can say that something like that. Of course, there is a lot of different cases, but I'll give you a big pictures. The first yellow economy is the economy of the house. So it's a service, a capitalism of care, entertainment, and goods. That means, as you said just before, that means that also it is not only used to produce something, but it's used also as goods, okay? Around that, the plantation is really a monocultural capitalism. So, you know that in a plantation we only cultivate one thing. So it can be a coffee, it can be uh, sugar, uh, it, can, it can be cotton. But it's only one thing, it's a monoculture. And really often that monoculture is not coming from the region. For instance, things, uh, people think that bananas are coming from Martinique, which is not the case. They are coming for uh, Ivory Coast, but they have been imported, and we, they create a monoculture of bananas in that region because of the climate. Okay, so after that, there is that grey zone, which is problematic with the, with, at the moment of the Dutch uh, government of Brazil, for instance, and I call it the contingent anti-capitalism. What does it mean? That means that people that are living really close to the plantation, but they are, uh, they are free because they, uh, they are runaway slaves, they come back really often to the plantation to make some uh, uh, so-called razia or red, 
to take things in the plantation. So they keep the plantation as a main resource, of, of, and so they stay quite close to the plantation, hidden in the hills, and come at night to take all the slaves with them to constitute a kind of collectivity, or to take some means, or to take some water. You imagine the plantation as really often created uh, on the Caribbean on the coast, and there is a lot of volcanic island in that region, so really quickly you got hills. And so in the hills, it's harder to cultivate things, and it's much more dangerous. So for the small marronage, the idea is to stay close to the plantation. And after that, there is, of course, the town with the commerce and entertainment and concerning the, uh, the free people of color. And far away, and this, I will finish with that part for, for me, just to make the loop in between the first question I've been asked about the monoculture and the periculture, there is what we, co we could call now in the Western country the super cool biological agriculture. That means that people are producing for themselves only to hit. So here in the center of the economy of plantation, there is a monoculture, mainly created to export some, some goods. The sugar is not for the locals, the coffee is not for the locals, the cotton is not for the locals. And if I'm come back here, I would say what the, the output of the, uh, of, the, of the plantation is the sugar, cotton, coffee, etc. The input, they are slaves. And you see the different potential movement of of, pe of people from the different parts of that kind of era. But what is really important in, to finish with that is just to say that with the question of the, um, the racism, the kind of racism that is created in the context of the plantation, considering that as a liminal sin of the capitalism and the racism, got different kind of level, but what is super clear and what is staying central at the moment we live is that the refusal of a potential autonomy of the economy of a minority. And it's super important, because in the debate and other days we think the racism is caused that and that. I do think and argue that the racism is a problematic of autonomy. You see that when the Mounds people are, 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 are deciding to leave from the first Marona space to the second one, it was, and arriving there are just not that things that autonomous anti-capitalist and commoning permaculture and cruel garden, but I add that that green zone will be the future zone of extraction. That means that at that moment, the capitalism let people do their thing because they don't care about that era further than the cost, but they will care about that later. And so all the discourse that people have about the uh, um, potential uh, construction of community from the minority is always a problematic of taking them what they built. So they try to build a kind of autonomy, and so in the plantation, we always had in mind the slave and the masters. But there is already some response at that very moment, and since the very beginning of the plantation, there is already response of that oppression by creating a kind of mixed culture, and, uh, including indigenous uh, knowledge and people in the Grand Maronage, to create new way of cultivate for yourself, it's super important, it will be the base of the creation of a language, of the queer language too, that, that begin at the house to finish, to be realized in the context of the Grand Marronage. And so I do think that that possibility of being out of the, of the influence of the light of the house is the first thing that, I've, that, that, is, that is really the, the dynamic of the races that we're living at the moment. And I would like to examine it with more precision later. Thank you. Our next uh, co-panelist is uh, Kalpana Seshadri. I hope I, miss, I pronounced correctly. He's prof. Yeah, he's professor of English at Boston College, where she teaches courses. Where she teaches courses in postcolonial theory and contemporary anglophone literatures. She has published widely in the field of critical race studies and continental philosophy. She is the author of Desiring Whiteness, a Lacanian analysis of race, humanimal race, law, language, and the co-editor of The Preoccupation of Postcolonial Studies. 
She is currently wrapping up a book manuscript entitled Post-Human Economics, Earth, Race, Epistemology. Among her publications are translations of the philosopher Giorgio Agamben and essays in journals such as Critical Inquiries, Social Text, Philosophy Today, Cultural Critique, etc., etc. So, Kalpana, it's yours. Mike. Yes. Table, yeah. yes. Okay. Okay. Is, is that is that the right position? How do you feel? It's okay. Is it okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Kader, for having me. It's a privilege to be on this panel with Zakia and Olivier and the rest of the, you know, um, the conference uh, participants. Uh, this paper is, I think, it's mercifully short. So thank you so much for uh, hanging out and being here to, 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 to listen to some of my thoughts. Um, so uh, I've been, I'm on a, on a, I think I've been on a single track throughout my career where I have thought about nothing except the nature of race. And that has been what I've been grappling with. And over the years, you know, I began by thinking about the ontological effects of race. Uh, and I felt that I needed psychoanalysis to sort of really explain our attachment to racial identity. And then I wanted to sort of grapple with uh, how dehumanization works or, you know, or race is one thing, but what, what is the experience of dehumanization? And then I find myself now having to sort of grapple with the post-human. So I feel like I'm on a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of a, it's a track that I'm on. So, so this paper is titled, Is the Post and Post-Human, the Post and Post-Racialism? I have borrowed the title of my paper from Anthony Appiah's well-known essay, written in 1991, uh, Is the Post and Postmodernism the Post and Postcolonial? In that essay, Appiah takes up the forms of artistic imagination and creative expression in Africa through mainly sculpture and literature to suggest that in a globalized world dominated by commodity capitalism, the concept of modernity acquires multiple histories and meanings. As opposed to the careful mediation of authentic, what is authentic African realities by mostly very elite, Western educated, post-colonial intellectuals located in the Western Academy, right, who, who mainly engage in the struggle to question modernity's privileges and exclusions. So, you know, uh, African artists, he, he writes, are immersed in another vision, in, in another vision of a less anxious creativity that in some sense is not merely a response to the demands of global market and its aesthetics. Appiah's essay is useful for my purpose, which is to situate the politics of race in, the relation, in relation to two other postal terms, post-human and post-racial. So I'm sort of interested in what is the post-human and, and how you know, the race plays a, a role in this. By pluralizing the definitions of modernity and post-modernity in the African context, Apia effectively indicates what may well be called the post-Africanism of much-lived experience and art from the continent. In this, move, in this move, he anticipates the work on, excuse me, all these posts, but this is deliberate, the post-blackness that emerged in the early, to, early 2000s in the US, exemplified in the work of Kara Walker and perhaps uh, films by Spike Lee, for example, Bamboozled, I'm thinking Bamboozled, which I've written about, which came out in 2000, and an explosion of other films and prose narratives about the black middle class. Right? In the Obama era, post-blackness became a watchword for African-American individualism. As Toure, uh, who's a sort of a popular writer and a journalist and a reporter for MSNBC and several other, you know, um, sort of out channels, uh, cable channels, etc. As Toure argued in his 2011 book, Who's Afraid of Post-Blackness? And if, you've, if you're aware of this, I'd love to talk to you about it. Uh, such individualism had little to do with transcending race or leaving blackness behind. Rather, post-blackness was a way of celebrating the plurality of black voices that were, to borrow Appiah's words, less anxious, 
right, about the authenticity of their chosen lifestyles or artistic expressions and the prestige value of, those, of these to the representation of the black community. In other words, to celebrate post-blackness was decidedly not to claim that the times they are post-racial. It was mainly the liberation of African Americans from being subject to the strictures of what to Ray terms racial patriotism and race duty. Right? So post-blackness is not post-racial. I mean, he was quite clear about that. That's the post-blackness in the, in, the, in the 90s and early 2000s in the Obama era and the optimism of that era was a way of pluralizing the discourse of black identities. Post-racialism would be a way for rapidly assimilating immigrant and minority groups to disavow the racial specificity of their life practices. In other words, claiming to be post-racial was a way of saying that race does not matter, or that one's race identity or community was irrelevant to the chances, opportunities, and choices that one made in one's life. As the legal scholar Kimberly Williams Cranshaw suggests, to assert a post-racial identity was also necessary to advance, was also necessarily to advance color blindness as a dictum of social policy. She writes, quote, color blindness not only undermines law and social policy that rely on race conscious analysis, but also soothes anxiety about the stubborn endurance of the structures of white dominance. If color blindness marked race as a forgettable chapter in our history, then post-racialism ensured any as yet unpersuaded stragglers and doubting Thomases, I just love that, doubting Thomases, that this mercifully retired saga of American racism no longer cast its shadow over contemporary affairs. Right? So uh, colorblindness, I mean, I, I think is, is sort of something that's been left behind. So ultimately, the deeper logical problem of post-racialism pertains to the fact that race identity is primarily a social description that can be either confirmed or just weakly repudiated. Thus, there is always a question of address. To whom exactly is race irrelevant? So well before post-humanism came into view as a new frontier of philosophical discussion, post-racialism had already been hotly debated and interrogated for its consequences to social policy. Eduardo Bonilla Silva's 2014 book, Racism Without Racists, Colorblind Racism and the Persistence of Racial Inequality in America, settled the matter once and for all. There is a clear consensus that post-racialism or colorblindness is a discourse embraced almost entirely by conservative thinkers who question the value of affirmative action and other race-based programs that aim to redress social inequality and discrimination. So I concur with many of its critics that post-racialism is a concept conceived in bad faith and was invented to protect, uh, was invented to protect white privilege and to erase, deny, and rescind the political gains made by African Americans and other non-white groups in the US. That colorblindness as a social policy or practice has very little support among progressives is a foregone conclusion. A university degree is not required to realize that when race is ignored in the distribution of resources or the assertion of civil rights, it produces and reinforces inequality. So given the low regard that notions of post-racialism are held in, especially within the critical race studies circle, it can come as a surprise to hear that the contemporary crises of economic and, and environmental inequalities that have precipitated a plurality of interdisciplinary discourses under the rubric of post-humanism are suspected of repackaging post-racialism in the guise of a depoliticized eco-romanticism. How did this association of the post-racial and the post-humanist, of post-racial and post-humanist discourses come about? What is it about the critical tools constructed by post-human discourses that give rise to such a perception and raise political suspicion. For starters, I would say that though post-humanism is not coterminous with environmentalism, there is indeed an unquestionable overlap. In this regard, there is a not entirely unjustified sense among many at the receiving end of the climate crisis that mainstream environmentalism in the West is shaped entirely by white actors and their interests. It. Furthermore, we must admit that for all its interdisciplinary claims, 
Posthumanism, with its focus on evolutionary and geological timescales, can appear deaf and blind to historical trauma. As evidence, one can cite the fact that these discourses do not exhibit much diversity in terms of their interlocutors, be they social movements, theoretical resources, or historical narratives. Nevertheless, despite these major shortcomings, I think anti-racist politics stands to gain by disarticulating these two terms, post-race and post-human, in order to understand and clarify the post-humanist position on race. Thus, so this is what I'm engaged in, and I want to clarify this, and I think I have some colleagues who are also interested in the same thing. I hope it will be a collective effort, an effort that will grow. <laughs> Thus, we must begin. Thus, we must ask, what is hidden or obscured in this conflation or reduction of post-humanism to post-racialism, and what or how race figures in the critical problematics of post-humanism? I proceed from the belief that clarity on this issue is more urgent than ever if we are to make way for real change and confront the problem of whiteness that marks humanism and the dominant strains of environmentalism in the West. What is at stake in this endeavor is a powerful opportunity to discern new possibilities for a clearer, more illuminated anti-racism that is implicated in post-humanism. I suggest that post-humanism is inherently antithetical to post-racialism. And when it is deployed as a particular, and honed as a particular political tool, it can be thoroughly and wholly anti-racist. Okay, and when I say, when I write ra anti-racist, I write race slash ist, because I think the distinction between race and racism is a false one. I mean, I think the system of race already embeds within it, is inherently racist. Uh, in fact, what can distinguish post-humanist anti-racism from other idioms of anti-racist struggle is its potential to scale up the question of race to the planetary level, to expose a racism as a practice in, intrinsic to the climate crisis. But first, let's deal with the perennial question as it is posed by many. What is post-humanism? There have been many productive and excellent responses to this question. Carrie Wolf, Neil Batmington, Catherine Hales, um, you know, Karen Barad, you name it. I mean, it's, it's huge. Donna Haraway to a certain extent. And rather than review them here, I propose that we approach the question a little differently. Instead of asking what is signified by the term post-humanism, which assumes that it can be assigned a recognizable theoretical unity, we can ask what is signifiable or re-signifiable with the term serving not only as a signpost, right, but also as a tool of political intervention. To echo Foucault, we could ask not what is post-humanism, but what can post-humanisms, in the plural, do? I think of posthumanism, for my part, as first and foremost a site, a watering hole, right, where critical human animals, and that's the title of my other book, but I, I love the term, the neologism, human animal. I use it as a way to refer to people who have experienced and who have fallen into the, who have fallen into the dark side of humanism, who experience the dark side of humanism, which is dehumanization. Right, who know those two things are, go together. There's no humanism without dehumanization, the possibility of dehumanization. So human animals are those who are aware of this. Right? Human, so I think of it as a watering hole, but critical human animals gather to examine the legacy of humanism and its sovereign capability to dehumanize. In this, I agree with Carrie Wolf, who suggests that post-humanism is fundamentally a philosophical and political critique of humanism whether it engenders an alternative ontology of the post-human, right? I mean, if you want to follow the Deleuze um, track, I mean, you know, the, the a positive ontology after the end of ontology, right? Uh, I think that's very much open to debate. As a gathering place for ideas, post-humanism resists attempts to unify the term conceptually or attach it to a theory or school of thought or philosophical tradition. Definitions at this entry level can be constraining and counterproductive. Thus, familiar charges such as the one levied by Christopher Watkin, excuse me, in French philosophy today, New Figures of the Human, 
where he uh, looks at the work of Alain Badiou, uh, Catherine Malabou, Quentin Messou, and uh, Bruno Latour, uh, I think he really misperceives the term posthumanism. He writes, posthumanism has become a passé partout signifier grain of determinate content, which brings very little clarity and adds very little analytical value, unquote. I suggest that the lack of determinate content, the emptiness of the signifier posthumanism, is necessary in order for it to mark a terrain for progressive political discussion regarding the implications of race and species ontology. Instead of a determinable theory, we can conceptualize the term as a signpost, or better yet, as a big top, a circus tent, under which we can gather certain new currents of thought that interrogate the foundations of philosophical and disciplinary humanism and its normative definitions of man, mankind, humankind. However, within this noisy and disorderly arena, I myself would assert that the salience of the function of posthumanism as a tool for political upscaling of grievance you know, cannot be denied. Right. Particularly where race is concerned, my sense is that posthumanism is a critical tool that, that can expose racism as the invisible and fundamental taproot of our present planetary crises. Thus, I propose that those who discuss the human-animal binary or the numerous crises pertaining to climate change without reaching all the way down to the root where it is supplied with the logic of race, or those who discuss race and economic inequality without scaling all the way up to the concern for planetary being, are epistemological retrogressive. So I think we need to really scale up all the way and think really big. So, I, so what interests me nowadays, epistemologically speaking, is thinking in terms of complex systems. Right, and sort of seeing race as a kind of a driver in some ways for making sense of the climate crisis. So race is a category of analysis that helps us make sense of the climate crisis. So we have to scale up. We have, we have to sort of think in, 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 in larger macro ways. That means that is how one does micro politics. I know that sounds paradoxical, but that's how it works. May, so mainly, when you don't scale up or you don't reach down all the way to the taproot where race supplies the logic of the climate crisis, mainly, if you don't do that, we risk lapsing into familiar humanist methodologies that Deleuze terms arborescent as opposed to rhizomatic, right? Which I think is really a fabulous a way of thinking about new ways of thinking outside the kinds of categories that we've inherited, right? Uh, that is a production of segmented knowledges that divide and separate modes of being in order to represent them in lieu of perceiving the complex entanglements and connections that dynamically map reality. So the, the aspect of Deleuze that I find very attractive for thinking about posthumanism is, of course, his, um, his deep debt to Spinoza, right? And to the idea of being able to sort of say, once again, that being is one and it is plural. Right, I mean, and it's, it's, I think it's a really powerful, which means you have to think in a completely different way, right? And to uh, sort of, um, and, and you have to mine a completely different archive altogether, not, not a, a very different philosophical tradition. Okay, having stated my intention to distinguish the project of posthumanism from conservative post-racialism, I must nevertheless acknowledge that there has been a significant and resounding silence within this critical space on the question of race. I am not interested in charging one or another thinker with negligence for their lack of attention to race. But I think we can see how the project of posthumanist discourse has gotten ahead of itself in turning so exclusively and decisively to questions of speciesism, the binaries of human versus animal or human versus machine, without fully contending with the dark side of humanism's power to dehumanize and its fundamental investment in race discourse. Remarkably, what posthumanist discourses have failed to confront is the way common sense ideas of race are in fact imminent to almost all critical thinking that we practice nowadays. In other words, the logic of race is not simply an object of critique that can be safely left to race theorists, right? I mean, some people do that, I don't do that. I mean, I have colleagues who say things like that. Uh, colleagues who do contemporary theory, contemporary philosophy, who say, I, I, I don't do race, that's not my theme. 
It sets me off. <laughs> okay, so my, my point is that under nuanced, under nuanced assumptions about race are imminent to the methodologies of much social and philosophical critique. How race informs the way we problematize anthropocentrism is in fact an enduring question for post-humanist epistemology. Thus, to critique the humanist conception of man and his distinction from animal or machine without simultaneously grappling with humanism's continuities with race and racism, race racism, poses some serious problems for post-humanism. Exclusive attention to speciesism means that post-humanism has a propensity to A, perpetuate the myth of humanist universalism, where man is an undifferentiated category whose difference from the non-human is the only matter of concern, right? So this framing has the effect of superseding the politics of race. B, it trivializes the way race discourse ranks human difference along a spectrum of humanity as less or more fully human by dismissing race as a social construction. It trivializes race, basically. And C, it obscures the essential function race discourse plays within speciesism. Thus, posthumanism avoids encountering the peculiarity of race discourse, namely that as a socially and culturally constructed epistemology of human difference, right, it's a very, it's a Western epistemology, right, it produces powerful, nevertheless produces powerful ontological effects that are unthinkingly assimilated into political critique. What makes such assimilation possible pertains to the peculiarity of race as a discursive formation. As I argued in Desiring Whiteness, a Lacanian analysis of race, race emerges in and as the confusion of nature and culture, biology and sociology. Though it is a historically specific and culturally inculcated way of reading human bodies, right, it is nevertheless constitutive of the subject in contemporary modernity. Right, so it's both things. One's unconscious attachment to the self-evidence of racial embodiment is an effect of psychically complex symbolic regime. Right, and it's, this is, and it's very culturally specific, and it's, it's specific to the modern subject. Thus, when humanist or post-humanist scholars engage in the interrogation critique of human essence, their discourses are always already entwined with the logic of race. Thus, it is incumbent upon post-humanist epistemology to grapple with the modern subject's unconscious attachment to race and the way race informs and organizes human difference. I'm not saying this is easy to do. In fact, I think what makes race so challenging for post-humanism pertains to its disavowal, to, to its disavowal by humanism, right? So humanism has always disavowed race and racism. The majority of self-respecting humanists Right? Pay no mind to race, as it lacks ontological substance. They'd be the first ones to say it. Race is not to be countenanced, as it has no scientific basis. Thus, they're quick to inveigh against racism, but even quicker to accept race as a social construct with proportionate political significance, but only mainly for minority groups. That is why, under liberal humanism, race always refers to non-white people. This is nonsense. I mean, this, this is nonsense logic. It's not even logic. It's illogical. That post-humanism must expose rather than perpetuate. To put it in hyperbolic terms, we can say that race is the post-human supplement to humanism, right? So within humanism is the kernel of a, a post-human supplement, and I think that is, that, that's what race is, right? And it's disavowed by, by humanism. Neither nature nor culture it pervades the organization of human difference. In fact, we can go further to say that the conceptualization of difference within humanism is shaped by the logic of race. By neglecting to contend with the supplement, post-humanism perpetuates this logic, right? In fact, it perpetuates the disavowal that humanism engages in, disavowal of race, right? It gets implicated in it and what's more, remains oblivious to the powerful structural element of humanism. To a powerful structure, to, to, to the fact that this is a supplement that is really essential to humanism. In what follows, I elaborate on these points to clarify that race is not only salient to post-humanist analysis, 
but that rec recognizing the salience also precludes posthumanism from being a type of what some critics are calling beyonderism, that is, beyond the human, beyond em embodiment, etc. So, how am I doing for time? Am I? I, I just have a few pages. Okay, I, I'll try, okay. <laughs> all right, because it's a train of thought and I, I, yeah, okay. So first of all, okay. Seven, not five. Okay, first of all, let us come to, the ter with, to, to terms with the post in posthumanism. My sense is that this post has to be understood not in relation to humanism alone. Okay, so what posthumanism is, is not just, it's not just not humanism but rather to humanism, anti-humanism pair that dominated in the second half of the 20th century. So there's a difference between anti-humanism of, of, of the second half of the 20th century and post-humanism, which I think is contemporary to the present moment, the 21st century. Anti-humanism is fundamentally, as Kate Soper has, has shown, a French philosophical wave that rose in the wake of the student protests of 1968. Kate Soper's book, Humanism and Anti-Humanism, offers by far one of the most cogent accounts of the issues and themes that predominated among a large coterie of diverse French thinkers inspired mainly by their reading of Heidegger. From Derrida to Lévi-Strauss, Foucault, Lacan, Delors, Lyotard, Althusser. So Soper distinguishes the various strains of humanism as they were manifested during the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, Romanticism, the Industrial Revolution, and 20th century British scientific positivism. And she argues that despite the superficial disagreements, there was, a, there was nevertheless a continuity of theme, uh, and which ba basically has to do with their profound, with, with all of these trains of humanism having a profound confidence in, human, in, in the powers of human being to come to know and thereby to control our environment and destiny, right? In a sense then, the various anti-humanisms that emerged in the post-war era set themselves in opposition to the notion of human sovereignty. Thus, anti-humanism undertakes a radical questioning of traditional human ontology founded on the empire of reason and scientific truth. What comes under, so you know, this is what we see in Foucault, we see this to a certain extent in Derrida, we see this you know, um, in, um, in, 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 in other thinkers. What comes under scrutiny is the entire foundation of the mythology of mankind, right, uh, that forms the core of all humanisms. This mythology is founded on the moral doctrine of species commonality, that is that all human beings or homo sapiens share a set of inalienable attributes and unquestionable humanity and are therefore equal, right, and have a right to uh, claiming the right to life, which is human rights, right? So it's that whole matrix of thought that they're critiquing, the anti-humanists. These ontological attributes went beyond evolutionary mutations, right, according to the humanists, such as bipedalism or the capacity for language. But it, it included or referred to notions such as agency, free will, responsibility, moral judgment, uh, the dignity of the human, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these get sort of like questioned, interrogated by the anti-humanists. So sorry, and this is so telegraphic and uh, raw, but I have no choice in this, you know, <laughs> lack of time. All right, so these essential human attributes are also, also position man as the maker and the driver of historical process, a sovereign form of life that gave meaning to the world and to the cosmos. For anti-humanist thinkers influenced by Nietzsche, right, and Heidegger, and especially in the French tradition, always in the French tradition, I think, it is these essential truths that merited questioning and critique through nuanced and detailed argumentation, right? And we are entirely indebted to them. I mean, I don't see how you can do post-human work without, uh, humanist work, without ha going through these thinkers. Right, okay. Uh, thus, within the enterprise of anti-humanism, the human as a figure of, of natural unity, self-sufficiency, and sovereignty is perpetually haunted, undercut, and made partial by its logical dependence on the excluded elements of the cultural and the non-human. Uh, for Derrida, you can think of the, of the you know, of the, of the gram, the graph, you know, the technology, the animal, structural objectivity, the mark, you know, the supplement, so on and so forth. Unlike anti-humanism, though, right, post-humanism is not concerned primarily with theorizing the death of God and man, right? Rather, it's a slightly different idiom. I think it's a, it's a, it's a rather it is a terrain for speculation about what is possible in relation to the political, the epistemological, the aesthetic, and the ethical 
following the critique and the death of natural humanity. So in that sense, it does not reject, surpass, or overcome the deconstruction of human, non-human pair. Rather, we can say, following Christopher Watkin again, that it makes a new claim on the concept of humanity. Right? It's a new way of thinking the human as emerging from the entanglements of the organic and the inorganic, the mineral, the cellular, the, the living, the non-living, expressed, for instance, by complex system sciences in and through the breakdown of disciplinary boundaries between physics and biology, and more broadly, the sciences and the humanities. Right? So science studies becomes, I think, a very powerful sort of, you know, um, sort of uh, discourse within post-humanism. My intervention is situated at this point where disciplinary boundaries give way to new ways of reclaiming humanness, if reclaim is the right word. I mean, I'm not happy with that word. Uh, with new ways of thinking humanness, shall we say. Uh, my, my sense is that in this rush to reclaim the homo within the context of the new sciences of climate change, the sixth extinction, global inequalities, and other crises, post-humanist thinkers thus far have privileged the problem of speciesism and have ignored the presence of race at the underbelly of so-called essential humanity. In other words, they have neglected to un encounter the unspoken role played by race discourse and race logic in the construction of humanity's commonality and difference. If the antinomy between humanism and anti-humanism sought to forget race as an ontologically invalid social construction, right? Post-humanism in its project to rethink epistemology in relation to climate crisis must necessarily reckon with race, right? So anti-humanists, I think, had the, shall we say, the, the license to forget race. So in that sense, they were reproducing a certain kind of a, you know, epistemological move made by humanism, right? I, I, though I think, to be fair, I mean, if there's one thinker who's really aware of, of, of this, it's, it's Derrida. Uh, I, I, I don't think people read him in that way, but I, you know, if you read The Ends of Man, I mean, I think that's what's going, sorry. Okay. All right, okay, so, the, uh, right, my intervention situated at this point, in the rush to reclaim, uh, et cetera, post-humanist thinkers have published the problem of speciesism and ignored the presence of race. In other words, they've neglected to encounter the unspoken role played by race discourse and race logic in the construction of huma humanity's commonality and difference. If the antinomy between humanism and anti-humanism sought to forget race as an ontologically invalid social construction, Post-humanism and its project to rethink epistemology in relation to climate crisis must reckon with race. I've already read this. For what post-humanism is in a position to discover is despite all its disavowals, race has always served as a post-human supplement to humanist conceptions of universal man, right? I mean, I just look at these um, cornices in a way. That's enough. It'll remind you why humanism is a very particular racial discourse. Right, I mean, I, I, I've been staring at these cornices, yeah. Okay, considered from the point of view of genealogical analysis, we can say that the logic of race is in fact the condition of possibility for the thought of the post-human. Right, it's really fundamental. Post-humanism reopens the question of humanist man again. This time, not so much to declare his death, but to ask if he ever existed in the first place. When exactly was man, or even human being, a term for a shared common humanity, right? Uh, that doesn't look like common humanity to me. From a minority perspective, that there are continuities between humanism and racism is felt instinctively, I think, almost unconsciously by, you know, for, 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 many, for many people of color. I mean, we just, just, we just intuitively know it without even articulating it. However, it is not about pursuing these continuities at the level of which great humanist philosopher said what or who subscribed to what ideological superstition. I'm not interested in biography or biographical statements of you know, what the humanist thinkers thought. Rather, I'm more interested in asking how the assertion of commonality and shared transcultural human essence is founded on the logic and structure of race. Race discourse has always functioned as a post-human supplement to humanist man. I've said that over and over again, I'll continue saying it. European humanism is characterized by its assertion of a shareable singularity, a phrase used by Julia Kristeva in her 10 Theses on Humanism. She continues to use it. In the longer version of this paper, a very problematic thinker, I think. In the longer version of this paper, I argue that there is an important unacknowledged correlation between the assertion of common humanity and Europe's discovery of human difference. My sense is that 
this coincidence of the discourses of human sameness, right? We're all the same, you know, all human beings, regardless of skin color, we're all, we're all human, you know, emerges at the, at the same time when human difference was discovered, shall we say. Uh, my sense is that this coincidence of discourses uh, of human sameness alongside the discovery of human difference also necessitates a notion of universality, a way to manage this ambivalence. Humanist universalism serves as an interesting and multi-pronged function in the scenario. It protects from difference, right? It's like a prophylactic. It masters difference and it rules difference, right? Quite simply, what is universal is, of course, Euro European notions of human essences. Thus, uh, Max Weber's famous question as to why the West alone produces universal forms of cultural and moral expression is very apropos, ironically so. European humanism has to function as a universal constant based on a transcendental ideal in order to regulate the hidden role of race. Right? Europe's way of dealing with difference was to invent the discourse of race. As I've already indicated, the peculiarity of race discourse pertains to its status as a social construction and has profound ontobiological, ontobiological effects. Though race is recognized as a discourse that has no philosophical or scientific basis and continues to signify embodied difference with biomedical and, of course, socioeconomic implications. So just to conclude, uh, I would say, let's see, let me dump, jump to a place where it actually takes longer when you do that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah that, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, right. Thus, okay. Um, the fact that this, I, I don't know if I can do this, but I'll try. It might sound disjointed, but um, okay. So the universalization of human being and of humanity means that humanist man who's constituted by the discourse of race and whiteness, which I think is a very important concept to um, interrogate, uh, is always in a state of war or competition with the so-called fellow man for access to whiteness or full humanness, right? So what race is is fundamentally a way to sort of reach the transcendental ideal of, hum of humanity and hum full humanness. The liberal response to this problem is to decry the competitiveness and to uphold the universal ideal of humanness. In short, the ambivalence of humanist universalism derives from its racialized kernel. A post-humanist epistemology must contend with this hidden structure of race at the foundation of humanist discourse of universality. In other words, if universalism is always coded by race, it is deeply consequential for the way we grapple with globalization and climate crises. We cannot create, in Deleuze's sense, a new ontology of being if we don't question human singularity and universal essence as first and foremost a problem of racial epistemology. In other words, there are very different ways of being human. That, and I just want to leave it up. Thank you. All right. Sorry. <laughs>